This is the Immunology Final Exam Review. I'm going to spend some time today going over everything that you can expect to find on your Immunology Final Exam. You will also be receiving an, a detailed outline study guide that you can use to study. This is just touching on the high points and kind of giving you a guide on what to focus on. The exam itself is 100 multiple choice questions. So first, starting with a basic immunology overview. We learned at the beginning that the function of the immune system is to recognize self from non-self and um, defend from non-self, right? We are all born with an innate immune system. This includes our skin and mucous membranes. Over time, we start to adapt, where our adaptive immune system comes into play, and things like T cells and B cells start to develop, to develop a memory. We kind of need to understand where these things come from. So we know that bone marrow is a primary lymphoid organ and we have things like lymph nodes and thymus and spleen and things that are going to be your secondary lymphoid organs. Know a little bit about the natural passive um, artificial, um, that the vaccine is an active artificial um, form that provides long-term protection and that um, when something crosses the placenta, that refers to something like passive natural. So understand those processes. We also learned that antibodies are formed in response to an antigen, right? Those are secreted from plasma cells. And just one little bit of extra information here is that CRP is an acute phase reactant. First, we looked at antigens and antibodies. We learned that there's a primary and secondary response when it comes to antigens and antibodies. In the primary response, we've got more IgM, and in the secondary response, we have more IgG, which goes and stays higher longer, which we'll see in the next slide. We learned that IgG can cross the placenta, that the antibody class is determined by the heavy chains, and we have a picture up there on the top right. Um, be familiar with what a heterophile antigen is. We learned about this more with the Epstein-Barr virus mono chapter. But that's an antigen that is present in different species, but not in relation to the evolutionary relationship of animals. Also be aware that if you want to make a great antigen, that you want to be made up of protein, and you have to be foreign, stable, and very complex. We also learned about some of the other things like IgAs found in tears and saliva, IgE, and bound to mast cells causes, which are basophils, causes the release of histamine and heparin. And know that the variable region of the heavy and light chains are where the antibody binds. Those kind of look like the jazz hands on the end. We built those um, in one of our labs. Here's that primary and secondary response that I just referred to. So when you're first exposed to something, of course, your body is just getting used to it. So you're going to have a high level of IgM. So when we talk about some of the you know, disease states later on and the infectious diseases, when we're testing for those, if you have a high level of IgM initially, that means this is probably the first time you're exposed and you're actively sick. If you have IgG, which will come in the secondary response and be the major player, it's probably that you've been exposed in the past. Um, another thing I want to add about IgM is he's very large. He's that pentamer, great for complement fixation, and is a great agglutinator. After that, we discuss cellular immunity. I talked about the uh, basophils releasing histamine and heparin. Uh, be aware that T cells are CD4, CD8. We find CD2 in all stages of T lymphs. Okay, and the B cells are usually the plasma cells that secrete the antibodies. Know that interleukins mediate reactions between leukocytes. We talked about the different phases of um, phagocytosis. The, I call it the Ken and elephant probably dig dirt. That refers to chemotaxis, adherence, engulfment, phagolysosome formation, digestion, and destruction. We also looked at diapedesis, which is the movement of a cell through a wall. Okay, so if you're in the bloodstream and you want to make it into the tissues, process of diapedesis is how that would happen. Be aware that neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes are all phagocytic, and that macrophages are phagocytic and also nonspecific, so they can kill pretty much anything. Know that the cytokines we use in a clinical setting are interferons, interleukins, and the GM-CFUs. We also discussed some neutrophil and monocyte macrophage disorders. The neutrophil disorders include Shadiak-Higashi, which is impaired chemotaxis, 
chronic granulomatous disease, which is where there's a, an issue with um, hydrogen peroxide production. Sometimes it's referred to as oxidative issues um, where the um, organism or the cell cannot destroy the microorganism in when it's inside. Uh, myeloperoxidase deficiency, that would be a defect in the bacterial cytolability ability of neutrophils, a very difficult time, and we'd see a lot of bacterial infections. There's also the monocyte macrophage disorders. We had Gauchers, okay, that's the beta-glucose cerebrosidase enzyme, and the neiman pick which is the deficiency of sphingomyelinase. Complement was a big favorite for everybody. I mean, that was sarcasm. Um, you don't have to memorize this. Um, Exactly. Okay, this is a pretty in-depth picture, but you do have to understand the different parts and pieces. Okay, um, know how we test for them. The CH50 is for the classical and the AH50 is for the alternative. RID refers to testing for both. For the classical cascade, an antigen antibody starts that. Know the MAC attack is 5 through 9. Know that C4B2A is the activation unit in the classical pathway. When we hit C3, that's where we hit our maximum amplitude. That's also the one that's in the greatest abundance um, in the human body. Know that there's three stages, the recognition, activation, and the MAC. The component that binds immunoglobulin is C1Q. That C3B is a great for opsonization, increases phagocytosis, and makes that um, bacterium extra tasty. C5 convertase is C4B2A3B. The component that starts the alternative pathway is C3. I've got the C3 and C5 convertases here that you need to be familiar with. Know that sialic acid on mammalian cell surfaces can inactivate C3B, and that's important because you don't want all that C3B on your own cells so that your own cells would destroy yourself, right? Know that factor D cleaves and activates factor B, and that properdin is a potent stabilizer. This whole entire process comes into play ultimately for cell lysis. We want to destroy those foreign organisms. The next pieces were agglutination, precipitation, and labeled reactions. I want you to be able to recognize what type of testing is taking place based off the definition. Okay, So you're not going to have to draw any pictures of a sandwich assay or anything like that, but just be able to recognize. So know the definition of anti-human globulin that was involved with our you know, agglutination. That forms cross-links between antibodies bound to RBCs. So, of course, if we have IgG reactions in an IAT and blood bank, we need that anti-human globulin in order to visualize that reaction. Know that APO antibodies are usually IgM. That AB is the universal blood recipient. AB would be the universal plasma donor. And O type would be the universal donor for blood. So, know the difference between those. Know that a prozone reaction is excess antibody, postzone is antigen excess. Know that the DAT detects antibody attached to cells in vivo, which is inside the patient, and IAT is in the test tube. Know that IgG likes the 37 degrees. Remember, IgM can handle just about any temperature. He's a big guy, he can bind just about anything. He can also react cold. Uh, lattice formation is the second stage of agglutination. We got the sensitization, then the lattice formation. This is from cross-linked antigens and antibodies. We talked about DFA and IFA, IFA, those direct fluorescent antibodies, usually uses a slide. We use a fluorescein conjugate for those. Know that in non-competitive reaction, the antibody is directly proportional to a reaction. And in a competitive, it's indirectly proportional. We mentioned sandwich assays. Um, I have a picture of that up on the top right. Um, that one is where emitted light is directly proportional to the amount of antigen. You can see it kind of makes a sandwich up there. Be familiar with the fluorescent in situ hybridization that we paint genes with those. Know that a precipitation reaction involves a soluble antigen and a soluble antibody. And be familiar with the ways to increase agglutination by using centrifugation, enzymes, anti-human globulin. Next were the hypersensitivity reactions. Know the difference between each one. So if I were to say, uh, what type would involve uh, blood transfusion or uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia? You would have to know that that is type 2. So be able to know what 
each type is and what it involves. And I have some nice pictures here and some nice explanations. Next was lupus and autoimmunity, and then we talked about tissue and transplants as well. MHC is a major histocompatibility complex. This is something that allows our body, in most cases, to recognize itself as self so it doesn't destroy itself, okay? This becomes a problem, especially with organ transplant, because when we receive a kidney, our body recognizes that it's foreign because it doesn't have our major histocompatibility complex on it, and it, um, you know, it will reject it. So with acute graft rejection, T and B cells, um, you know, cause that issue. You need to understand graft versus host. Know a little bit about um, systemic lupus, okay, butterfly rash. We see um, anti-Smith antibody with a speckled pattern and an increase in C3. Um, know that identical twin grafts never reject and know the difference between Hashimoto's and Graves. Celiac disease involves gliadin antibodies and tissue transglutaminase and Hashimoto's is very organ specific. And I have a great picture over here that kind of gives a little bit of an um, explanation as to what organ it affects and the tests that are done. So that's a great slide. Talked about tumor markers. We've killed this one in chemistry too. And we're also talked about it here, so these shouldn't be anything new to you. And we all know that a PSA is used just for screening. We briefly mentioned the immunoproliferative disorders. So uh, multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, multiple myeloma, we see that Ben's Jones and the M protein spike. In Waldenstrom's, we see a lot of IgM. Primary and acquired uh, immunodeficiency, you guys had some struggles with this week nine. The, um, know the brief definitions and how to differentiate. Okay, you don't have to know every single detail about every single one. I have pretty much everything here that you could really, really need to know um, with those. And with HIV, some of you guys really struggled with the glycoproteins as well. So the glycoprotein 120 binds to the CD4, and the 41 is just an integral membrane protein. We talked about all the hepatitis, herpes, and other viruses. Okay, we know what a torch profile stands for. Understand the different hepatitis B surface antigens and antibodies. Okay, know what they mean. Does it mean they're acute? Does it mean they're in recovery? Um, know that herpes is cold sores, and we find them in genitals as well. It's a cell-associated virus. Know that Epstein-Barr virus is associated with mono, Burkitt's lymphoma, nasal pharyngeal adenocarcinoma. And we have a few other things here as well. So like I said, be able to differentiate the difference. There's usually one thing that makes them stand out from the other. So I'm not going to go through and read all of these to you, but you need to be able to differentiate which one is which based on what I have here. And finally, we talked about the bacterial, fungal, and parasitic infections. We have a few things about strep, the hyaluronidase spreading factor. Sounds like mayonnaise, right? Uh, the M protein makes it very virulent. We do the ASO titer. Um, and we have a few other ones here too. C. diff, cryptococcus, toxoplasmosis. Again, be familiar with being able to differentiate these. The last thing you're going to find in your PowerPoint are review questions. I'm not going to spend time going over these because I want you to review them on your own and have some time to figure out what the answer may be. Okay. If you play this with notes pages, you will see the answers, but I want you to go through and try and answer these on your own to see how well you do before you go through and look at the notes pages to get the answers. If you have any questions, please let me know. Again, you'll find a study guide and this PowerPoint available in your online course in the course announcement for this week. Have a great weekend and a fantastic finals week.